Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Door to Door. Thank you for joining us. Chris Connolly here with the Library LFS team, joined by my esteemed colleague. Lainey Mays. Lainey Mays. Reporting for uh, duty. Is, guess, yes, and I guess that's kind of a twist. Uh, I did tell everyone that I was reporting to this event alone. That was not a lie. It was told in honesty, but this was a twist, and that's lovely. I'm so glad to be joined by Lainey, and also later in the episode, a surprise librarian guest da, 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 to talk about upcoming titles from HarperCollins that we're loving, and that's what's happening today. Now, uh, I'd also love to know what everyone else is reading. Do let me know in the comment section of the video. Um, but that's pretty much it. So we're going to talk about some fall 21, winter 22 titles that we're loving at the moment. And then we'll also talk about some upcoming door-to-door -door episodes that we know you all will not want to miss. So that's the itinerary for today. And we'll be sticking to it. And that's pretty much it. Am I missing anything, Lainey? That's it? I think that's that covers it. We're glad you're here, everybody. Yeah, I see Elizabeth Silver. Let's see who else is here. Carla Sudo, good to see you both. Thanks for being here. Yeah, I think we'll probably just dive right into it and uh, talk about, I guess for me, I'm going to talk about two really exciting Harper Voyager titles. I don't. I feel like maybe sometimes we, we, we don't talk about the sci-fi fantasy enough and I'm going to write that wrong for all you fantasy sci-fi lovers. So we have two Voyager titles. The first one is God of Neverland. And I'm going to show these jackets because they are completely amazing. So I'm so exists. excited for this one. Right. And great news. I think both titles, I mean, everything we're talking about today is available on Edelweiss. We'll be sharing links. But yeah, these egalities literally just went up. So it was divine intervention, I, I, I must say. Mm -hmm. So God of Neverland by Gamma Ray Martinez. This is a reimagining of uh, J.M. Barry's classic tale, and it's starring Michael Darling, who is the youngest of the Darling siblings, and he was a former lost boy who is now grown up. He didn't forget what happened in his time in Neverland. He has now actually been working with like this special force in the real world that kind of deals with keeping humanity safe from mythological creatures and demons and threats. Um, but something goes wrong on a particular mission he swears it off Michael does but then finds himself drawn back to the world of Neverland uh, why well because Peter Pan himself has disappeared and the magical forces in that land are kind of overflowing into the real world these worlds are colliding and Michael is taking it upon himself to return to Neverland find where uh, Peter Pan is gone and hopefully save both worlds all at once Hugely imaginative, so exciting. I love this jacket. Um, you know, fans of S.A. Chakraborty or Greta Kelly. This is this is so exciting. Um, it's a hardcover Harper Voyager title, and uh, it's a big book for us. And it's coming in April, but you can read the eGalley now, so that's pretty exciting. I will um, say just yeah. quickly. So Gamma Ray Martinez writes middle grade fiction. So if you know that name, maybe that's where that that's familiar he does the spellbound soul the goblin star book so just a fyi you're awesome lady yes thank you for mentioning um and then the second big voyager title that i'll be mentioning is the tension there we go the blood trials by annie davenport so this is the first in a new duology uh, this is also publishing april 5th Alley is available now. Um, that is kind of a big epic mix of speculative fiction, sci-fi, fantasy that follows this young woman who is basically battling, you know, a world that is run by misogyny, by racism, um, by huge power imbalances. Sound familiar? Well, this is again its own world, very vividly written. And she is part of this royalty where her family, her grandfather, who has actually trained her to be this like deadly warrior, is assassinated. And she knows there's this these political kind of intrigue at play that they're, not everything is as it seems. And she knows she's being hunted down because she holds this royal blood and also the magical powers that go along with it. 
So this is again going to be the first in the duology. The next one is coming out next year in well, I guess 2023. Excuse me, I'm living in 2022 already. Um, but I think it does, you know, it's perfect for that kind of YA crossover appeal because it deals with very real issues, whether it's coming of age, again, the just the racism that is implied in this world and how this young woman kind of goes about facing that and these issues and coming out the other side. So epic, exciting, inspiring. It, it's uh, going to be, again, another really important publication for us. I think Harper Voyager's list in uh, winter 2022 is incredible. So I'm really excited about that. And uh, so, yeah, those are just two Voyager titles that we definitely wanted to spotlight for you just at the top of the episode. <laughs> Let's see, as he certainly says, are pirates. I love pirates. Mm. I love Neverland. I love any iteration of that story. So, um, yeah, all about it. So two titles for me. Lenny, what do you what do you jazz about? Mm, so many things, but uh, maybe we we do a good transition from sci-fi fantasy with a little bit of speculative fiction. Maybe we talk about how high we go in the dark. Oh my gosh! I know yes, we both really like good. this book, and yeah. you know sometimes our Venn diagram that we say connects, and I guess it's just a circle at that point. But um, books that we both really love, and I think the last one really was. Uh, playing bad heroines and this is the same mm. editor that wrote that uh, brought this book to us so I think that's mm -hmm. fitting so we have how high we go in the dark by Sequoia Nag Amatsu and this is a really lyrical like larger than life novel it's so beautiful and um at first I mean it all centers around kind of this world def defining plague that happens and the many centuries after and I think when we first heard about this book at launch, a lot of us were like, oh, I can't do a plague book with what's happening. But I really encourage you to try it, even if like, you know, speculative books are not your thing either. Like, this is a really important book. And it is one of the most beautiful books I've ever read. And um, it, it will suck you in, it will bring some tears, but it's well worth that, that exploration into this world so like I said it's really um just a, like a beautiful uh, collection of stories I mean it, it all it, it goes in order you, you read them together but you kind of can go in and out of them in any order you don't really some of the characters connect but you they could be their own thing too um and it's in a near future and people are experiencing experiencing or have experienced um like I said this plague and the people um in the stories go in and out they travel through time and space and they really show you know it's about this plague but it at in the crux of it it's um uh, about coping with loss finding a new place to call home or finding love when you know you don't really think that you can do that again in this world it begins in 2030 and so there's a grieving archaeologist who arrives in the arctic circle to continue work of his recently deceased daughter so she was working in the arctic circle um in this crater doing research on a, a long buried um they they kind of discover a an archaeological dig essentially and he goes to take over her work because she just passed and he's dealing with that loss with her and dealing with taking care of his granddaughter but uh, when he gets there, they uncover this this body and they decide that there's a, a remains of a girl from, you know, an ancient world, but she had a virus. And so now this virus is into the world and it quickly, rapidly evolves and they call it the Arctic plague and it reshapes life on earth forever. You know, like he is dealing with the very, very close uh, proximity with it, but then from then on it just spreads. And so all of Earth is going through this plague together. And then it goes to like, you know, thousands of years later where people are looking for new places to live that are, you know, inhabiting places that are not Earth. Um, and Benjamin Percy, author of The Dark Net said, um, his is a singular voice and this is a book so original and wondrous and reality shredding that it easily defies summary and categorization, like a dream that feels more vivid than life. There's, and he, in this quote, it's very, it seems odd, but he says, Arctic plagues, euthanasia theme parks, hotels for the dead, talking pigs, interstellar star starships. Like it literally has all the stuff in there and it sounds wacky, but it is so pretty. 
and people um, having these relationships. And it's all about the day-to-day really, even though they're going through all of these weird things. And, um, you know, plague aside, it really does focus on the people. And um, there's a, a great behind the book piece where uh, he talks about how it was written over a decade. So he really didn't write it during the pandemic or during this time in our life, but it kind of became real to him <laughs> during that. But he's been writing it for over a decade. And he says, although fiction, although this is fiction, he pulls a lot from his life, his personal losses, his identity as a third generation Japanese American and a lifelong love affair with the stars. And so that really comes through in this book. Um, I really don't even want to give any away. I could go into like all of the, the talking pigs and whatnot, um, but I don't want to give it away. It's such a, a treat to read. Um, I don't know, Chris, do you want to say anything? Yeah. Better? I, it, I just agree with everything you said. And I agree also this is one of my favorite books and most one of the most affecting books I've ever read probably the most deeply humanistic book I've read just just the intimate details that he can pull out of his story including the talking pig which will break your heart but also just make you feel more alive than you've ever felt uh, and I think a great comp for me that comes to mind is Civil War Land and Bad Decline by George Saunders one of my all-time favorite titles where you know it could almost border on preposterous if it wasn't so deeply moving and heartfelt and just believable and just how he writes characters and how they feel in the midst of disaster. It's uh, it's so <laughs> brilliant. I just I adore this book. It's it's singular. So I'm um, really excited for people to get into it. Casey Davis, I see you said it sounds like Jeff Vandermeer and Diane Cook mashup. I'd agree with that. Um, Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, and like we said, Jessica Williams, the editor of this book, who also is the editor of many fantastic titles, uh, including, um, God, what are, what plain we, what bad are we yeah, Plain Bad Heroines, which I was looking for, I finally have the hardcover I yeah. just received, you know, just, just brilliance, just utter brilliance, so, yeah, Although, we can talk about this. Anywhere she goes, like, she brings it, yeah. and I know that it's going to be something larger than life, it's a great, yeah. Thing. Yeah, Great. just uh, incredible. So, so excited for you all to read that. So uh, that's coming January 18th. Again, all of these are available on Edelweiss in the galley, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, what else? What else should we talk about? I'll talk, um, because I have a podcast interview coming out later this week with this author, I will talk about it, which is, and I, I've spoken about this book before, but it, it does bear repeating because I think, again, it's a brilliant title, Fault Lines by Emily Atami. Uh, let me pull up the beautiful jacket here. This, da, da. sure. All right, great. So this is coming in September. Again, many of you have likely heard me speak about this book, but I, it just bears repeating how beautiful this is. This is a character study of uh, Mizuki, who's a Japanese housewife uh, living in Tokyo. She lives in this high rise. She's the mother of two children, has a hardworking husband, seemingly an ideal life. But she also kind of fantasizes about blowing it all up. Um, you know, and, and essentially, she happens to meet this uh, restaurateur, this kind of handsome, successful guy who owns these string of restaurants in Tokyo. And she begin, she kind of takes it upon herself to strike up this friendship. Uh, this starts simply as a friendship. She's kind of like leading him around Tokyo, showing him all the sights, the sounds, kind of re, kind of reintroducing herself as well to everything that she felt very separate from. She, I think that's a theme in the book, just how disconnected she felt from the life, the vivid life of Tokyo, looking down from her high rise. And so this kind of this passionate affair that develops. Uh, she rediscovers herself. She, you know, meets this man, rediscovers uh, Tokyo itself. And Tokyo definitely is like a character in this book. Um, and it just like all its various, you know, facets, like it's just this place that you could never know in its entirety because there's just so many layers to it. I think uh, Emily in the book describes it as a layer cake of sights and sounds. And I think that really makes sense. Just every floor, every building, every high rise is packed with all these possibilities and these, you know, beautiful, beautiful, just, you know, different ways of life all in one place. And it's just, so it's it's basically exploring her life. It's, it's she's very sarcastic and funny and kind of self-deprecating, but also very self-aware. Um, she knows what she's doing and she's kind of grappling with, 
Does she want the comfort of a domestic life and everything she knows, even though she's kind of dissatisfied with it? Does she want to blow it all up? You know, what is all this all leading to? Um, but it's just really beautifully told. And, and again, just I've never been to Tokyo, but I think she just draws out so much vivid detail and energy that you feel like you're there for sure. And I know, Lainey, you read this too and loved it, right? Yeah, this is this book was amazing. And it's a pretty short read, so you can kind of flip through it pretty quickly. And I read it in one sitting. Like, I couldn't stop reading it. And I, I'm not a mother, and I don't, I've never been to Tokyo. And you feel like you are in this character's shoes you know everything about what it means to have an exhaustion and a around raising kids in that city but also being taken not for your worth or like being feeling like an imposter in some ways around the other mothers and so which makes for some funny scenes with the kids I have to say um but yeah it was is a lovely book and that podcast interview is really great I've heard it and you guys need to listen to it on Wednesday so coming up right around the corner. Yeah, so that's uh, really exciting. That's again available. So that's 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 another that I loved. Um, let's see, should I go on, Lane? Do you have one you wanna? You yeah, wanna... go ahead, you go for it. Okay, um, since we're on the subject of podcasts, I will be interviewing the author of Reprieve, James Hom Matson. Uh, this just got a, Great star review was it Booklist or LJ Lane? I'm trying to think now. Uh, it was Becky who gave us a great rave review. Oh, jar- library uh, journal. Mm-hmm. Library journal. Thank Best you. star, yeah. So yeah, reprieve. James Hom Matson, uh, who's the author of Lost the Lost Prayers of Ricky Graves. This is a really sharp and affecting kind of mix up of horror, literary suspense, uh, social critique. Um, that takes place in like late 90s um, in Nebraska and follows a cast of characters who are connected through this full contact haunted uh, house called the Quigley House where there's I think it's six rooms total and groups of four try to get through this full contact haunted house and if you get through it all the way through without yelling reprieve which is a safe word you basically uh, win a bunch of money but almost no one ever has made it through. It's run by this really kind of enigmatic um, guy who's uh, he's kind of famous, he's infamous for this house and but his like desires and his, you know, what he's trying to accomplish with this house is really left kind of mysterious. But it is again about the characters in this story. There's Kendra who um, has to move here with her mother after the loss of her father. She's a young black girl who's kind of suddenly finding herself in the middle of a very white space and trying to find her own place within this community. And she ends up working at the Quigley house and suddenly finds herself kind of part of a group that she feels at home with. Um, And it follows her cousin, who's an older uh, man who's in college, just kind of like the the golden boy who she really looks up to, who ends up, he ends up competing in the house. Uh, You follow JD, who's a gay international student, um, who is kind of dealing with his own identity trying a lot of this is like how do you fit into white spaces and it's using the horror genre which has you know a lot of it has a history of how it approaches characters like whether it's a black character who dies early in a movie and isn't really given any sort of real humanity you know it it kind of is playing off that like horror and what it means to be you know a a a person of color or, or an lgbtq person in a space dominated by white storytelling, essentially. So uh, you have JD, who's really trying to find himself. He comes to the United States because he's in love with a former English teacher. And he's like, just bound and determined to find this teacher and kind of like strike up this imaginary love affair that he's always played in his mind. But he's also trying to fit into a predominantly like a white gay student group uh, who is just, you know, trying, again, trying to find a way to belong um, and then one of the most terrifying characters in this book, I know I'm going on, but a terrifying character in this book is this um, Leonard, who is, he's a hotel manager who has a really negative relationship with himself. And he um, basically falls into a relationship with the owner of the Quigley house who kind of sets him on this whole like toxic masculinity driven view of himself where he's like, you know, women are they're manipulative and, 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 you know, it's, it's all about men being dominant and, 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 
you know, the predominant, you know, the primary, you know, breadwinner, like that kind of mindset. And he ends up traveling to Thailand, like falling in love with a sex worker there. Um, and his psyche kind of unravels. So all these characters kind of converge at the Quigley house and you find out that there's a murder that takes place and you're kind of figuring out along with these characters, you're jumping back and forth through time, what brought them to the Quigley house, what's actually going on there and who was, who was killed, why it happened and who's really pulling the strings throughout all of it. So it's a really sharp story um, with some tragic characters. It's scary, but it also is just so brilliantly told and just a really sharp critique again of the horror genre. Uh, and it really uses it in a unique way. So um, I know I went on, sorry about that, but I, I'm really impressed by this book. <laughs> so it's uh, coming out October 5th. To apologize, it was a book list review, I'm sorry. Oh, um, yeah. but it was a star book list review and Becky Shepard, sorry, Becky, mm -hmm. I didn't mean to say the wrong one, but it's, she said, presents a brilliant hybrid, a thought provoking look at marginalization and systematic, systemic oppression expertly nestled inside a high anxiety tale about the horror industry itself. It's a great quote. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, yeah, this is an October publication. Really, really like this. And, uh, wait, William Morrow, Reprieve. Uh, this is, I think, another title that's edited by oh, pretty yeah. sure Jessica Williams. So we mentioned be a the theme. <laughs> editor for how how high we go in the dark and plain bad heroines. So yeah. you know it's good. So there's that. What about you, Lenny? Um, let's see. I want to talk about. I know we only have a few minutes, so can we talk about all her little secrets and death at Greenway? Because yeah, we're going to be sure. having them on, and I want to make sure to tell you. If you have not been listening to us already, we have told you about all her little secrets. Our lead read for the season by Wanda and Morris. It's coming out in November. We're very excited about this one. Um, a debut thriller about a woman who is a lawyer at a, a corporate lawyer at a transportation company. And she um, has a dark past. She's trying to hide some secrets. And when she goes to work one day, um, she is having a relationship with her boss and she comes into his office to find him dead and instead of calling the police she decides to run and uh with that comes some secrets from the past up from uh from the past so she is trying to navigate all of that but then also she's kind of shot up into his place and now she's not only the only black person in the room but she's the only woman in the room to a lot of those meetings so there's a lot of tokenism and there's a lot of um, discussion on, um, on on those situations, and so she kind of has to hold her own there too, as well as holding the past off. And it's just such a great, thrilling read. And um, you keep turning the pages. Love this book so much. So that's all her little secrets. And then the lovely Lori Raider Day, uh, Death at Greenway. That is her first historical mystery. So this is exciting for us. Um, She's an award-winning author and um, Death at Greenway, uh, it fictionalizes a time that actually happened where children during the Blitz were taken to Agatha Christie's um, summer home. And so she, you know, explores that it's fiction, but that's the, the base, the true story that happened. And so a nurse goes with these children off and, and some, a body turns up. So you have a great back, uh, backdrop set against all of the creepy uh, Agatha Christie love that comes in and a great library and a, a fantastic home but you you have a body there too and and kids to take care of so very fun and they are both going to Facebook live and we're very excited they, they also are friends so I think that'll be a fun conversation yeah I can't wait for that so yeah. that is next Tuesday I did provide the link in the comments I see a lot of love uh, speaking of which for both titles which is so great to hear. Yeah, we love both of these books. Um, okay, a few more minutes before our special librarian guest. I just want to call out a few books that are now available as e-galleys that I've spoken about before, but just want to make sure it's on your radar. Uh, so including Welcome to Dunder Mifflin uh, by Brian Baumgartner and Ben Silverman. This is like the definitive oral history of The Office. I'm re I'm rewatching The Office now for maybe the 20th time. It's It'd be sad if it wasn't such a beautiful show and it makes me feel good. So I no apologies 
for loving this book. So this is, if you, you'll, you'll know Brian, he's the author, or he's the actor who played Kevin Malone. Uh, so that's, and then Ben Silverman is uh, one of the producers behind the office. So this is interviewing all the cast and characters behind the scenes look at what made this, you know, again, uh, kind of like this singular show that continues to be watched and loved to this very day. So yeah, the e-galley is available now calling that out. Um, another book that I've really kind of been blown away by is Burnt Coat by Sarah Hall, which we've spoken about before, but now the e-galley is up and available. Um, again, speaking of plague books, this is a, a very character-driven literary look at two people who are kind of enforced proximity to each other in, the, in London. Uh, in the middle of an oncoming plague. It's uh, one woman who's a, she's a sculptor and she has this lover who she kind of recently just met. They barely know each other, but they find themselves kind of in her studio. She works on kind of these huge art installations and it's a really beautiful literary look at what it means to create in the midst of destruction, at, you know, how you reckon with the past as an artist and how you use that to make or destroy. Uh, and just really like beautiful uh, reflections on on what it is to be human. So she's she's a beloved author. Um, she's a prize winning author of five novels and three short story collections. And um, this continues just her brilliance. It's coming in November, and now the egali is up. So that's important to note. Uh, let's see what else is up that I need to tell you about. <laughs> So much. Can I read some of these comments? So yeah, sure. fault lines, everybody loves that. Kim Mickey said that um, she fell in love with fault lines, um, appreciated the beauty of Japan, and it was as much about her marriage or what was missing in her life as a travel guide to Tokyo. Um, Sylvia said that fault lines is loud on her radar, so that's exciting. And then uh, there was a lot of love for Death at Greenway, and Kim said also that Death at Greenway is awesome as an audiobook. She's listening to it. So you recommend it for Agatha Christie fans and World War II London. And then they're talking about also all her little secrets and how it's hopefully going to be so big. So anyway, just thanks for the comment. Great. Yeah, I, that's great. And I see Sarah Lee asked, so was the pandemic an inspiration for lots of novels or are the authors prescient? Um, I never know if I'm saying that word right, by the way. So correct me if I'm not. <laughs> but um, that's a great question. I'm not sure actually for some of these authors. I mean, as we mentioned with How High We Go in the Dark, uh, that was written pre-pandemic. So, mm -hmm. and I think some of these were written in the midst of it. Um, I know Louise Erdrich, for example, has a book publishing in November that she wrote basically throughout the year that she's describing. And it was the year of the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, think I think we see two different like thoughts on it either. And that might have changed too at the beginning of the pandemic versus the end. But it was either like, I don't want to go there in my books. I want to make it fiction and I want to get out of this world. And then some people were like, this has been calming and, and, and uh, kind of therapeutic to go through in that way. So I think we see both. Mm -hmm. but. Yeah, but that's a great question. Um, Oh, and I just want to call out Termination Shock because I'm a big Neil Stevenson geek and um, I know I'm not alone in that regard. So, and that is an e-galley, it's available now. And again, speaking of tough topics that people might want to avoid, but kind of are unavoidable, this is dealing with climate change, but only in a way that Neil Stevenson can and that it's like very deep dive. Um, I forget who it was who said that Neil Stevenson, he just knows how systems work, like global systems, whether that's, you know, geopolitics, the engineering side of things. He's kind of exploring all of that where this lone Texan takes it upon himself to start shooting big rockets full of sulfur into the air to cool down the planet. And it sets off this chain reaction of um, kind of inner, you know, geopolitical dynamics. Like it's, if you cool the planet, how does it affect India versus China versus low-lying places in Italy? It's all, but it's, you know, told through these cast of characters. It also deals with some interesting things I didn't know about um, the line of absolute control, which is this area between China and India that there's this agreed upon no fire clause where you can't bring weapons into this line of I think it's the line of total control or something like that. 
so there's a lot of like fist fights that happen where like there's never actually been any shootings but people can go and fight and so you have these it's a very weird thing where they're like it's almost performative and it all it all kind of wraps up together i'm not gonna give it away because i don't think i could in the time i have but it's a really interesting look you know again at, at a very near future i mean this is again maybe like 2030 he's starting the story at but you know houston is at like 130 degrees and things are going underwater and how do we engineer our way out of that and that's kind of what he's exploring here it's really thrilling and fun um and if, if his past is any any proof of the future he neil Stevenson tends to uh be pretty predictive of how things will go and i you know, you saw some of the temperatures that were hit this summer across the country. So it was maybe too soon, but here we are. So uh, I see Casey, da that's, that's the last book I wanted to call out. I see Casey Davis says Karen Slaughter's newest book is set in the mm -hmm. pandemic. I thought she did it really well where it's, yeah. it's just acknowledging it, but it's, it's not necessarily About driving that. the story. It's just like, you know, it's yeah. how we have to live. And she writes through that. So good call out. Okay. Um, so i think maybe just quickly can i talk about the as the wicked watch because i want to tell yeah. them to go back and listen to our in the spotlight thing mm -hmm. so as the wicked watch is the first book in the jordan manning series that um is written by tamron hall who you know you know tamron hall emmy award-winning talk show host love her and um she spoke at our in the spotlight event with Lori raider day and um sarah mclean and thank you and she they did an amazing job all three of them but uh this is the first in her series and it's going to be a mystery detective um you know series so i just want to call that out so you it's on your radar it is number the first one in the series and this is about a woman who is going to be a tv reporter in chicago and she kind of leaves where she is to be kind of in a bigger pond and now there's a serial killer on the loose and she she's connecting a lot of the crimes. She also has um, a master's degree in forensic science, so she can kind of be on the scene and know a lot of things. And um, she's connecting and telling stories of um, especially black girls who are going missing in the community and, and making sure they have a voice. So that one's really special for us, too. So I hope you check it out. Hey, so we'll share, we'll have a catalog that will share all the titles we discussed today. We'll put that, uh, that link in the comments section. So just keep looking for that. And I think without further ado, we should bring on our special mystery guest. I think so. Should we do, do we it? need a drum roll? Yes, let's do it. Do you have a sound machine? Oh. <laughs> no, I have my hands. All I don't right. know if you can even hear it. But Let us present. Uh, who is going to be? our special guest jennifer winberry hi. how are you thank you for Come having me down yeah hi <laughs> thanks for being here all right well jennifer with the hunterton public library did i say that right i said hunterton right. i said hunterton did you okay there's like I a lag know. yeah it's a lag let's blame the lag <laughs> <laughs> so uh jennifer you're gonna talk about some books that you're into right that's, I am. that's the gist of this yeah. I am. And I'm halfway through the, the Tamron Hall book right now and I'm like really, really loving it. Yeah. So um Yay. yeah, definitely. We're very so excited I'm, to have you. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much for asking me. Um because there's a lot of books coming out that I really can't. I just told somebody about one of these books this morning. Um, Black Girls Must Die Exhausted by Jane Allen, which is coming September 28th, and it has got a gorgeous Gorgeous cover. Um, it was originally self-published, and um, so now it's going to be a trilogy. That one, the second one, is not coming soon enough. It's going to be coming in February. Um, but I absolutely loved this book, and I think by page ten, I was so attached to the heroine Tabitha. Um, she's a thirty-three-year-old black woman, um, news reporter in LA, television news reporter, and she has her life plan a good education, a good job, um, a down payment for a house of her own. Now she wants to date only men who are the marrying kind with an eye toward marriage and a family. And she's checking all the boxes until she gets a diagnosis that she probably will not be able to have um, biological children of herself, her own unless she acts now. And then she starts seeing some cracks in her plan. Um, 
She's got medical insurance through her job, but it doesn't cover infertility treatments. So she might have to give up her down payment for her house um, in order to have her eggs harvested um, or give up the possibility of having her own biological family. Her boyfriend, Mark, who seems perfect, is doesn't seem quite so perfect anymore when she says, hey, we got, we got to do this now. We, you know, we got to start talking about having a family. And he's, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Um, she's competing for a senior reporting position, which she gets. But then um, her, the editor calls her in and says, well, yeah, you're probably the best person for the job, but you're really going to have to fight to prove it. Um, and she wonders maybe why she got it. Um, but then she sort of just regroups herself and says, wait, I can do all this. Um, she's got a super support system in place. Her besties, Layla and Alexis, but most of all, her grandmother. Um, her grandmother's a white woman who was married to a black man at a time when, when it wasn't done. Um, her son is Tabby's father from whom she's estranged. He left Tabby's, mo Tabby's mother for a white woman and started his own family. And, they're just starting to get back together and um, Tabby is starting to visit them more and um, spend time with her half sisters. But her, her grandmother, um, who Tabby's named after Tabitha is in a uh, retirement community and between her grandmother and Miss Gretchen, her grandmother's besties, uh, they, give, they give Tabby these pep talks every week when she goes um, and then Lexi is separated from her husband who's having an affair and Layla's having an affair with her married man. And the two of them start fighting and then they start fighting with Tabby. And she just kind of, she just kind of steps back and just says, wait, wait, I got to take control of the situation and I got to do this. Um, and her grandmother Tabitha always says black girls must die exhausted and Tabby realizes that she's pretty much right. Um, so once Tabby realizes, I think she has the agency to do this um, and to get it done and to make her own choices. Um, she chooses to wear her hair naturally on her television um, broadcasts instead of getting her hair done every week. Um, she starts to listen to another senior reporter who says, hey, we got to fight another woman who says, hey, we got to fight, fight this company for our medical insurance. We got to fight for better insurance. Um, like, why should we be excluded from certain procedures just because we're women? Um, so once she does that, she takes off with this fierceness um, and with the resolve that she's going to set everything to right and um, it's, it's going to be good. So um, I don't want to say any more, although if you've read the, uh, you know, if you've read the, the annotation for the second book, um, you know what happens. <laughs> Um, but it is, it's so astutely observed. It is a pure joy to read. Um, and it's coming in September 28th. It's also in the library hardcover. Um, I think there's a lot for book groups in it. Um, Jane Allen did a door to door with Kate Fair of, I hope this finds you well back in July 20th. So go back and read it. Um, and she did a couple of events at ALA. Um, and I just, I really, really love this book so much. That's so great. That's so great. You're amazing, Thank you. Yeah. I'm taking notes about how to book talk from you because I think you just oh, stole so much. No, no, no I'm, I'm serious. Like, I'm, I'm writing this. I'm like, wait, what would Lenny and Chris say? So no, stop. You're you're amazing. God. And uh, I just I'm reading the comments. I'm gonna read them for you. Casey yeah. Davis says Jennifer Winberry is my kindred spirit. We both like <laughs> grapefruit and sunrise walks. <laughs> uh, we got to let you guys meet, right? You hadn't met before we Talk I wasn't even food. sure we were separate people at one point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was it was great to meet her um, at your at ALA. At the... I love bringing people, bringing our friends together. We love yes. it. Um, yeah, that book. I'm so glad you mentioned ALA because she did that event with her editor, and uh, it was part of Gabrielle's Gabrielle Union's there was a co-event like separate but they were part of the same event and it was all about black maternal health and um they both had those themes in their book one nonfiction, this is fiction obviously but um i'm so glad you you talked about that because that was a great panel i thought i thought it was important to hear you know books being written by 
women and saying, I can see myself in these, these fiction books because they're not. Oh, I so wish I had had this like 20 years ago. Just, yeah. Like, because if your life list goes off, off the rails a little bit, you gotta like kind of regroup and, and Tabby did just that. Yeah. So, um, do I talk about another one? Please. Yes, please, yeah. Okay, the next one is by my beloved Wiley Cash. Um, when Ghosts Come Home, coming September 21st. And I can't believe this is only his fourth book. I mean, it just, it feels like he has been writing forever. Um, I got to interview him when his last book, The Last Ballad, came out a few years ago. Um, and he's just, he's so spectacular. This has had really great reviews from Kirkus and PW, and it just got a starred book list review. Uh, he just announced that. Um, the cover, again, is gorgeous. It's, this one is set, he, um, this one is set in where he's on the west east coast of um, North Carolina, um, in coastal North Carolina, which he said was a departure for him. Um, it's 1984, which apparently is not considered historical fiction. I'm really happy to hear that. Um, it's just before the election. Um, sheriff Winston Barnes has been the sheriff, and he isn't sure he's going to win. Again, um, he's being opposed by a young up and comer. Um, he's rich and he's questionable in his morals and his dealings. And he, Barnes is home taking care of his wife, Marie, who has cancer. Um, he's been struggling with his estranged, with his estrangement from his daughter, Colleen, who is living in Texas and who has just lost her son, her infant son. Um, and, Barnes wakes up in the middle of the night when he hears a low flying airplane to the nearby airfield. And he, I, I feel like he debates for a minute or two whether he should go out or not. Um, and he just, he goes through and he's, he's got this responsibility to his community, to his job still, even though he's pretty sure he's not going to have it, his job any longer. Um, and Maurice says, don't, you know, don't go out. And he says, no, no, I'll be back soon. So he goes out to the airfield, he finds a wreckage, but he finds no pilot and no cargo. And he does find the body of Rodney Bellamy, a local man who has been shot dead near the crash site. Um, so he, this big investigation is in his lap and it's gonna reach really deep into the community. Um, and it, I feel like instead of figuring he's going to lose the election and he'll just leave it for the next guy, he goes into it um, full steam ahead and he's, he's gonna give this investigation in this community his all, even if it's the last, the last big investigation of his career. Um, he has the community's very tense as to what's going on. Um, they, they don't know for sure. Um, they, they're just finding out the prevalence of drugs in their community. And I, I don't, I got the feeling a lot of people didn't really want to. He, Barnes is tired. Um, his, his wife is, is very ill. His, daughter comes home and is trying to sort out uh, her life and she's got this un unimaginable loss. Um, Wiley, Ka Wiley Karras's characters are just so well drawn. They are so full of life and so that you can imagine them as your friends and neighbors and even, even the people who seem insignificant were just like passing through. Um, like you, really, you really care about this community as much as Barnes does. Um, the setting is amazing and inviting. Um, and I think the 1984 se se setting, even though at the beginning of each chapter it tells you the date, I don't think you need to because he kind of just drops hints here and there. Um, Maria's car doesn't have a clock. He uses a walkie talkie. The phone is in the kitchen. It's probably on the wall. Um, and it just, it. I don't know, I kind of found myself saying, well, too bad he didn't, this didn't happen like 20 years later. It might've been a whole lot easier for him, but I think something, something really elemental would have been missing. Um, and everything is like just slowly revealed and slowly, almost slyly sometimes. And then you go back and say, wait, wait, that was important. Um, and the plot just tears family and the community apart and just, it tugs at your heartstrings. Um, Wiley Cash is a CWA Gold Dagger Award, two time Southern Book Prize winner, an Edgar and a pen. Um, Bingham finalist, and um, the ending is just, oh, it's so heart-wrenching. 
the ending was really, really, yeah, don't start with the ending. Just, <sighs> um, so that's when Ghosts Come Home, September 21st. Um, really, I really loved it. And if you haven't read his backlist, it's, it's not so big that you can't go back and do it. You know, go back and read everything. Definitely do that. That was the best when Ghosts Come Home talk I've, I've heard far enough. Uh, As, and and Wiley Cash was... is absolutely, I wanted to invite him. I do a podcast on Thursday mornings um, on Hunter and Chamber Radio. And um, I wanted to invite him back on. And I read on his website that he likes handwritten letters. So I hand wrote him a letter. Mm. And he, I got the letter back yesterday from him, um, apologizing that he teaches on Thursday morning. Mm. So we can't, we got, we got to figure something out. But I thought, oh my gosh, he took the time. That's right. the kind of person he is. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, um, yeah. I love that story. That's so sweet. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. So I, I, want, I do want to try to get together. Yeah. He's a wonderful writer and a wonderful human, and he, he oh. does he, he he knows what he believes in, and he's not afraid to 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 write it and to share it and to show it. And he's just yeah, he's he's a great human. So um, I'm still just like reeling from that description, though. You were just so good. That was oh, incredible. Oh, thank you. Do you have one more? One I more have course? one more, okay. um, and it's excited. nonfiction for me, which is. If it's not a book about books, it's it's unlikely I've read a nonfiction book. Um, but this one I read after after Chris's after you book talked it, Chris, and after the um, door to door back in June, um, we had Matthew Pearl on the taking of Jemima Boone, which is coming out in October. So there's still time to read it for li- a vote for library reads. Um, Matthew Pearl is the author of the Dante Club, and this is his first work of nonfiction. Um, and it tells the story of the kidnapping and rescue of the frontierman Daniel Boone's daughter, Jemima, shortly after the Declaration of Independence was signed. Um, and I was really intrigued that um, Matthew Pearl tro- chose to write it as nonfiction rather than a historical or biographical fiction. Um, but it really does read as an adventure novel. And in his acknowledgments, he does give a nod to um, The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper. Um, so, yeah, and on the door-to-door, he talks so much about his research, which he did part of it with his son, um, which was so great. And it was the it was so well-researched. Um, there are notes in the, the advanced reader copy. Um, I don't know if there'll be a bibliography or if you just kind of have to, but it's, it's just pages and pages of notes. Um, and it's amazing to think that there are, um, the, the, there's such good documentation even from things written in the mid 18th century or events from the mid 18th century. So 13 um, year old Jemima Boone and her friends, Betsy and Fanny are in a canoe on the Kentucky river one day. They live in a fort in Boone's, um, Boonesboro in Kentucky um, that her father has obviously helped settle. Um, there's ongoing tensions and even a feud with the Cherokee Shawnee who takes who end up taking the girls. Um, Hanging Ma is the leading chief. And once he realizes who he has, he realizes that she can be used as leverage um, in order to drive the settlers out of Kentucky. But what he doesn't count on is Jemima Boone's um, survival skills and her her cleverness. Um, Since Daniel Boone and the men are so often away from the fort, um, the women um, have learned to um, to fend off attackers. Even at one point, uh, led by Jemima's mother, they hand guns out to every all the women and children and say, okay, everybody shoot at the same time to scare off, um, to ward off some attackers. So um, again, they have agency and they've become very capable. Um, the girls are cunning and clever and not only do they manage to stay alive, but they can also, um, they've also left a trail of clues because she knows her father's gonna come Come for her um, so that they can aid in the rescue effort. And then after it, there was, I don't want to, I don't know what's a spoiler alert and what's not, but um, the last couple of chapters, I'm like, wow, I never, there were just a lot of things about Daniel Boone that I had never read. Um, so if you like historical fiction, uh, historical nonfiction, um, 
Nathaniel Philbrook, Simon Winchester, anything from um, Revolutionary War, mid 18th century. And I can even see reading this as a book group. Um, pick even for book groups who are, are really steeped into fiction. I think, um, I think people would find a lot, and there's a lot to dive into if, if you find something that you really like. Um, there's a lot, you know, you can deep, dig deeper and you can track down some of his, his sources. So yeah. um, that's a, Taking a Climb a Boom by Matthew Pearl. That's great. You know, in that book, there's the, the story about the tradition being where like if somebody in in the Native American tribe is killed, they they are taken over and they they join and become kind of right. like take that role over. And that just has stuck with me from that book. That's what I think of immediately. It's like reassessing everything you know about like loss and 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 like, can you imagine you someone's killed someone and now they're your your surrogate son? Like you have to take yeah. them in. And I don't know. I just love what he did with all of that information. Like you were saying, you just so much stuff you didn't know. And yeah. it's packed with so much stuff. But it's yeah, like you said, narrative nonfiction. So kind of like like Earl Swift, if you guys are a fan of Earl Swift, that'd be a good one. But wow, that was great. So yeah. That's what I got. Thank you so much. <laughs> and Kim thank McGee you. said that she agrees with all of your picks. She oh, thinks these are great. You. <laughs> yeah. You're incredible. That was an incredible book talk. Three fantastic choices. And yeah, I'm, I'm seriously taking notes. I will add Kimberly McGee said just finished the, the taking of Jemima Boone. Wow, I had no idea about that part of history and how connected Daniel Boone was to the Native populations and the politics. Uh, and also that was my favorite part, taking someone yeah. in to make things even, and then they really treated them like family. I'm like, how we would handle them, yeah. very true. I also did um, really think about how connected he was to the um, revolution, mm. the Declaration of Independence, because he was like in Kentucky, he was a frontiersman. He was exploring mm -hmm. and starting yeah. new settlements, but he was already on that manifest destiny. Um, yeah. That's interesting. I love learning something new. And I think that book's a perfect example. And I like that you said that you think book clubs, even ones that really only read fiction would like it. I, I think, I think so. A, it's a good recommendation. Yeah. yeah, I think, and I, I liked when I ran our book club, our book group, I liked pairing it with fiction. So I think like you could say, well, you could read the last movie can, and or this. Um, I think that would be a good, mm, good right. pairing. That's a good idea. Yeah. <sighs> Thank you this so much. Ball. Thank yes. you. It was fun. You're a star. This will not be the last time we have we have you on. I think uh, this is this was too good. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and we want to thank you, Jennifer. Extend the thank invite. You. So you know we love having you on. We love hearing what you guys want to read. So librarians out there, if you want to come join us, like Jennifer did, then we would love to. Oh, Jennifer, I want to tell them about when you did our Instagram takeover. So oh they can gosh, go that find was out. So much fun. <laughs> they can go find out more about um, your library because you yes. took over, and I'll put a link in here. But you took over our Instagram, and I thought it was so fun to get to see where you work every day and what the library does because they were giving vaccines in the parking lot at one point. So you Pretty much us that. Yeah. yeah, like I mean, that was a bigger operation than what I just said, but you know what I mean. Um, yes. And so that was really cool. So thank you for doing that too. Oh, thank you. It was it was a lot of fun, and we were still working at home part of the time during that. So um, yeah, we were just just coming back to the library. Yeah, and you took us on a walk with you because you go on walks in the morning. It was just a lovely yes. takeover. Yes, I yeah. don't. Did I? Yeah, I just I did do that on so. the takeover. That was yeah. my audition for you guys too. Yeah, that was your audition, and you nailed it. <laughs> uh, so um, I see Jane George says she was uh, she was hesitant on Jemima, but your book talk, Jennifer, made me download it. Uh, and Sylvia asks where we can find your podcast. Is it uh, they go to Hunterton-Chamber.org? Is that where um, they, they go? It, it is there, um, but I also stream it live on Facebook. Um, okay. So just Hunterton, Hunterton County Hunterton. Library. It's live on Thursday mornings. Okay, um, and I'll share. Don't watch it this week because I don't have an author. <laughs> I can hear from you. I mean, yeah, it's just it's just like me okay. talking to myself for an hour. Um, but it's a lot of fun, and and the library book buzz team was on. It's been on a couple times. Um, yeah, but it's it's been fun. really great because now we've we figured out how to zoom people in, and it's just not me talking on the phone to an author. Um, 
so it's it's really been expanded and it's great yeah okay so for everybody listening i'm putting in the link for your instagram takeover okay and i can put the link um after after this i can put the link to the podcast in the, um, that'd be great and take over so they can find out more about the library um yeah so let us know if you want to come on door door you want to take over instagram we would love to hear more from you guys so this has just been lovely a lovely afternoon thank you so much yeah. and uh, again just as a reminder before we sign off next tuesday is door to door with wanda morris and Lori raider day that's going to be amazing I think, Elaine, did you mention they are good friends? Mm -hmm. Lori's been with Wanda every step of the way throughout this process of getting it to publication, and I can't wait to see them chat. Uh, and then we'll have more door-to-doors -door -door after that, obviously, but on September 7th, we are going to have Ann Patchett and Elizabeth McCracken in conversation. So uh, it's kind of a big deal. So we'll I'm sharing a link to that event here do sign up. And um, between then and now, we'll have more door-to-doors, authors, book talks, hopefully librarians like you. And until then, everyone be well. Thanks for joining us. And again, a big thank you to you, Jennifer, for being amazing and for the book talk and for joining us today. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Happy reading all. You have a lot for your list today. <laughs> yes. Be well, be safe, and read well. And uh, we'll see you very soon. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.